Kwanzaa is a holiday that has loosely been taking form since the early 1800s. Today, we know it as a holiday that is celebrated starting the day after Christmas that goes until New Year's Day. Well, during slavery in the United States, the period from Christmas Day to New Year's Day was often given as a rest period and a time of celebration for enslaved people since roughly 1812. Add in some African principles developed by Marcus Garvey 100 years later, and some more detailed shaping up of ideas made by some people in the 1960s, and you get what Kwanzaa has evolved into today. Now let me be clear, this video is not a hit piece on Kwanzaa. While I have never celebrated it and never will, I don't see any problem with its seven principles, unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith, not standing alone by themselves. All of those things seem harmless enough, even possibly good, but what doesn't seem to be harmless or good is the man whose name is most widely recognized as being the founder of Kwanzaa, Maulana Karenga. Is that his name or his alias? I mean, isn't that what criminals use? After all, he was born Ronald McKinley Everett. If you Google his name, you'll see that Wikipedia says that he is best known as the creator of Kwanzaa. You'll also see that his criminal status is paroled. And that has something to do with why I think that he should be known as someone more than the founding father of Kwanzaa. He should be known more widely by a few other labels like possible accessory to murder, accused rapist, and definite torturer. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about your favorite and most scandalous names from yesteryear that make the Ty Said What Ty Said channel a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream and comment I subscribed in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Now, on to why you are here. Let's call him Ron Karanga for the purpose of this video. We know that he is a, and often considered the, founder of Kwanzaa. He is also a professor of African American studies. He is also an author and is still called an activist. And it was in his twisted, perverted activism where his most heinous crimes were committed in the 1960s and 70s. He doesn't do interviews with mainstream media. He seems to carefully pick the people and organizations with whom he will sit for interviews. And not surprisingly, the results of those interviews are fluff pieces that praise his work as the founder of Kwanzaa and as an educator. But here are the things that I think Ron Karenga doesn't want to discuss in interviews. Murders of two members of the Black Panthers committed by his Black Power organization and his own physical and sexual torturing of two women who were in his organization. First, the murders in which he was closely involved. This won't take long. We'll get to what he did to those women next because there was a lot more information available on that situation. On January 17, 1969, on the UCLA campus, a meeting took place to determine who the Black Student Union would appoint as its director. There were two competing factions, one led by the Black Panthers, specifically Al Prentice, Bunchy Carter, and John Huggins. And the other was headed by us, Ron Karinga's group. U.S. that stands for United Slaves. Very empowering, right? According to Ron Karinga, United Slaves' mission was to revive African culture because that was the salvation of American Blacks. 
So, the nominee to direct the Black Student Union, who was put forth by Ron Karenga and us, lost. And when he did, Ron Karenga's United Slaves members pulled out guns and killed the two Black Panthers, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins. Five of Ron Karenga's US members were indicted for murder and conspiracy as a result of these killings. Three of them were ultimately apprehended and convicted of second-degree murder. Yet, Ron Karenga's involvement as the leader of this organization has been widely swept under the rug. Why? The prevailing thought that was then and is now is that underneath Ron Karenga's shaved head, daishiki, and bad Swahili was just someone who was secretly working as a police agent. You can dive into that for yourself. On to the torture of the women in his organization. I can speak more freely and more in depth on this matter because Ron Karenga was found guilty of this and did serve time for it. And there are a few records of the court trial in existence, mostly periodicals that reported on the case. In 1971, just five years after the founding of Ron Karenga's holiday, he was convicted of felonious assault and false imprisonment for torturing two women who were members of his US organization at his Inglewood, California home, crimes for which he served four years in prison. Here is what the Los Angeles Times reported on May 13, 1971, in an article called Karenga Tortured Women Followers, Wife Tells Court. Quote, Black nationalist Ron Karenga and three members of his militant US organization beat and tortured two of his young women followers a year ago, Karenga's wife testified Tuesday. Mrs. Brenda Lorraine Karenga, who now lives in Virginia, said Karenga sat on the stomach of one of the victims while water was being forced into her mouth through a hose. She testified that she also heard screams and yells coming from the garage where the defendants were holding Deborah Jones and Gail Davis, both 20, and noises which sounded to her like someone was being whipped." End quote. But that's just a small part. Here are some of the details that were told on the witness stand during the trial against Ron Karinga and his co-defendants. The victims, Deborah Jones and Gail Davis, both 20 years old at the time, said that they were at Ron Karinga's home when, in a drug-induced fit, he accused them of trying to kill him by placing crystals in his food and water and in various areas of his house, which was never found to be true. When the ladies denied it, these are the things that Ron Karinga did to them, or told his United Slaves cult followers to do to them. The women were told to remove their clothes, then, naked, they were beaten with an electrical cord and also with a karate baton. They were hit on their heads with toasters. A hot soldering iron was put in Gail Davis's mouth and against her face. One of Deborah Jones' big toes was placed in a vise, which was ordered to be tightened by one of the defendants. The following day, Ron Karenga told the women that, quote, Vietnamese torture is nothing compared to what I know, end quote. Luz Tamayo, the second defendant, and you'll want to remember that name, her name, reportedly put detergent in their mouths. Lewis Smith, another defendant, turned a water hose on them so that the hot water was running full force on their faces, and Ron Karinga, holding a gun, threatened to shoot both of the women. Thankfully, he didn't shoot them, but he did, according to sources, burn both of the women with lit cigarettes and insert a water hose into their vaginas while forcing alternately cold and very hot water into them. During the trial, the scars and cuts on Deborah Jones' back were shown to the jury. Now, 
All of this is beyond terrible. It's enough for me to end this story right here. But you'll find that this video is like a very disturbing infomercial because wait, there's more. Seemingly, Ron Karanga had all of his torture plans already laid out. But according to Deborah Jones, the detergent and water hose punishment was added by Ron at the last minute simply because she would not cry after having been subjected to all of the other torture that he had already put her through in that ordeal. After all of the testimony and evidence was presented, Ron Karinga was convicted on two counts of felonious assault and one count of false imprisonment. He was sentenced to one to 10 years in prison in September of 1971. The sentencing judge read a psychiatrist's report into the record. It stated that since incarcerated, Karanga, quote, has been exhibiting bizarre behavior, such as staring at the wall, talking to imaginary persons, claiming that he was attacked by dive bombers and that his attorney was in the next cell. Karanga now presents a picture which can be considered both paranoid and schizophrenic with hallucinations and illusions, inappropriate effect, disorganization, and impaired contact with the environment." End quote. Well, I guess that Ron Karinga worked out all of those issues in a relatively short time, because despite the viciousness and the extent of his crimes, he only served four years in prison. One of the things that helped him to get out so quickly was that psychiatric evaluation that concluded that he was insane. That evaluation, coupled with a fierce letter-writing campaign from his extreme followers, led to the granting of his parole in 1975. So I'm sure that you're thinking he got released, and because he served such a short sentence for such heinous crimes, he hung his head low and went to live in hiding for the rest of his days. No. That's not what happened at all. Four years after his release from prison, he was hired to run the Black Studies Department at California State University in Long Beach. Since then, both Ron Karinga and Kwanzaa have received overwhelmingly favorable coverage from both national and local media. His past crimes, violence, and time in prison are hardly ever mentioned. On the rare occasions when the subject is raised, Karinga merely lies and says that he was a political prisoner during the 1970s. Political prisoner, my Heine. Now, I'm not saying that Ron Karinga was or was not, or is or is not some type of police agent. There are people who hold him accountable for his crimes who still debate that point. But I will say that there are a couple of reasons that I can understand why people might think that. One, the court transcripts from his trial seem to have disappeared. Had it not been for newspaper archives and other periodicals that followed this trial, I would not have had a lot of material for this video. And I'm glad to see that I'm not alone. When Paul Mulshine, a New Jersey journalist, was researching Ron Karinga back in 1999, he was advised that transcripts of witness testimony from Ron Karinga's 1971 trial simply could not be found. He, like I, was forced to rely on newspaper reports. And number two, the other thing that makes me understand why people think that Ron Karinga is an agent is his personal prisoner to professor pipeline. The fact that he went from being a prisoner to being a college professor is odd. That is an unlikely upward move to be made by a felon of any race. I truly don't have a stance or a concern on his status as a police agent, but I understand the suspicions that many people do have. Take a look at this Jet Magazine from June 3rd, 1971. There is a story about Ron Karinga's trial. Not a lot stands out as different from the other sources that I have used, but this article lists the names of Ron Karinga's co-defendants. That part reads, quote, Karinga and three others, Fred A. Seifu Glover and Louis Seydoux Smith, 
both 19, and Luz Maria Tamayo, 23, are all charged with multiple counts of conspiracy and felonious assault in the beating of Deborah Jones and Gail Davis, both 20." End quote. Now, if you read a lot of the material that you can find regarding the torture of these two women, you'll be led to believe that Ron Karinga's wife, who testified against him, Brenda Lorraine Karinga, was helping him abuse those young women. Several sources are vague and just say things like, Karinga and his wife are charged with assault, or his wife helped him torture two women, things along those lines. Well, it is true that Ron Karinga and his wife assaulted Gail Davis and Deborah Jones, but it was his current wife who helped him to torture those women. But wait, there's more. I told you to remember the name Luz Tamayo earlier. I told you to remember that name because she is his current wife. She is the same Luz Maria Tamayo mentioned in this 1971 Jet article as Ron Karinga's co-defendant. The same woman who was mentioned in the 1971 Los Angeles Times report earlier only as Luz Tamayo. Most sources that say anything about their marriage, the marriage between Ron and Tamayo, that is, say that the couple was married in 1970, which is only interesting because the news articles about the trial all show that he is still clearly married to Brenda Lorraine Karinga in 1971, hence her having to waive her right to refuse to testify against her husband, per the beginning of the Jet Magazine article, which starts off saying, Waiving her right to refuse to testify against her husband, Mrs. Brenda Lorraine Karanga, and of course it goes on. Maybe so very many sources say that Karanga married Tamayo in 1970 by accident. Maybe they all got it wrong on purpose. Maybe it's all just a huge coincidence. Or maybe he made some type of unlawful commitment to her after they bonded over torturing two women even though he was already married. He has been accused of being a polygamist by two people who were once very close to him, so this idea is not far-fetched, but we'll get to that later. Right now, let's get into the fact that the pro-black man who created a pro-black holiday is now married to a woman who presents as a non-black Latina, the same woman who helped him to savagely torture two black women. If you're wondering why any of this matters, see what Dr. John Henrik Clark had to say about Ron Karenga. Dr. John Henrik Clark was a professor and pioneer in Pan-African studies starting in the 1960s, and he was a contemporary of Ron Karenga's. He's also had some pretty harsh words for Louis Farrakhan, but that's another story. According to Dr. Clark, Ron Karenga, quote, has not atoned for the way he treated black women. The women he mistreated and mutilated were dark in complexion. The women in his harem are light in complexion. The number one woman is a Mexican in what seems to be an Afro wig." End quote. Um, does that sound like it could be a description of this person? Dr. Clark went on to say, quote, He not only has a color problem, he's got an ego problem too. When he travels, he rarely lives in the black community, end quote. Isn't that an odd thing to hear about a man who has made a living off of being pro-black? Now, colorism wasn't a word that people were throwing around at that time, but it sounds like that is exactly what Dr. Clark is suggesting that Ron Karinga is a colorist who places no value on dark-skinned black women, which is why he brutally abused them and didn't think twice about it. Is that what you are hearing? Please answer in the comment section, I'd love to see your thoughts. But let's get back to this part from Dr. Clark. The number one woman is a Mexican in what seems to be an Afro wig. The woman who Dr. Clark was calling a Mexican in an Afro wig all of those decades ago was Luz Maria Tamayo when she went to prison for torturing two black women. 
Today, she proudly stands as Ron Karinga's wife, Tia Moyo Karinga. Do you see how her last name became her first name and she made a slight change to it? Now it's almost impossible to link Tia Moyo Karinga to the horrible crimes that Luz Maria Tamayo committed in 1970. Her new alter ego is reminiscent of Rachel Dolezal, if Rachel Dolezal were a vicious, disgusting woman beater. But if you take a look at Tia Moyo Karinga's bio on blackpast.org, one of the ironic facts about her that you will see is this, quote, deeply concerned with women issues, she is also a member of the International Black Women's Congress and the National Council of Negro Women, end quote. Now, I have only told you how Tia Moyo presents to me as a non-Black Latina, but the document called Extent of Subversion in the New Left, Testimony of Robert J. Toms, a source that documents some actual congressional hearings from 1970, gives a description of her. Once the parties at the hearing were able to figure out just who the heck she was because of all of her names. Ron Karenga and his United Slaves cult is one of many subjects discussed in these hearings, and this is how his wife, then co-defendant, is described. Mr. Terabochia says, also, he had a girl interpreter by the name of Tamaya Tiamoya. Are these two individuals still active with Ron Karenga at present? Mr. Toms says, yes, they are. Tia Moya Tamayo is known to us as Maria Luz Tamayo, a female Caucasian who resides in Los Angeles and is Ron Karenga's secretary. Well, give it up for her, because she has come a mighty long way from whipping naked black women and pouring detergent down their throats, to now being deeply concerned with women's issues and a member of black women's organizations. And give it up to Dr. Clark. This is why he kept referring to her as a Mexican in an Afro wig. He traveled extensively with Ron Karinga and Tamayo, and he wanted the world to know what he was seeing. She and Ron Karinga, the wonderful Wizard of Kwanzaa, sound like a perfect match made in hell. And while we're on this document, I just want to quickly point out two more things. At this hearing, they really were trying to figure out just who the heck Tia Moya was. See here, quote, Tia Moya Tamayo is unknown to this department unless she is Luz Maria Tamayo, shown next to Karinga in the photographs, end quote. And it's still just as hard today to put all of her names together and know that the person who was a torturer back in 1970 is a black woman and black woman's activist in 2021. And in case you're wondering, yes, every time that I say Tia Moya Tamayo, I am also thinking of Tia and Tamara. Secondly, there is this, which also supports Dr. Hendrick Clark's claim that Ron Karinga was a polygamist and had a harem of women with Tamayo at the top. It is the list of the officers of United Slaves. Keep in mind that this hearing was in 1970. Brenda is listed as an officer, and we know that she was his wife and that she was still married to him in 1971 when she testified against him. And Maria Luz Tamayo, his partner in crime, who is way more often than not shown to be his wife since 1970, is also shown as an officer at that time. After reading everything that Dr. Clark had to say about Karinga, and seeing how the timelines with these women are overlapping, I have a hard time believing that Karinga wasn't sleeping with both of these women at the same time, and possibly others too. I could be wrong, but he seems twisted enough for that to be the case. This couple, wow, if revisionist history was a couple. There you go. 
I know that this information is a lot to keep straight, so this particular document, as well as some of the other redacted documents that I have shown in this video, will be available for my YouTube channel members to see. But I digress. If Dr. Clark's information isn't sufficient for you, as proof that Ron Karinga is completely unfit for leadership, perhaps the words of Wesley Kabila will suffice. He is the man who was assigned to Ron Karinga's personal security for years. In an open letter about Ron Karenga, he maintains that Karenga was not only responsible for the torture of those two women who were in his United Slaves organization, but that it was part of an ongoing pattern over the years. And even though every source that I have cited so far says that the torture of Deborah Jones and Gail Davis lasted for two days, Wesley Kabila, who was up close and personal with Ron Karinga, says that those two women were in fact tortured for upwards of three weeks. I will not read his entire letter to you, but here are parts of what he wrote. Quote, I feel, however, that it is equally important that Dr. Karenga be open and honest about the demise of the US organization, 1969 through 1971. For too long now, he has incorrectly asserted that members of the organization left him and that his jail time was served for trumped up charges. It is my opinion that one of the reasons it remains believable that Dr. Karenga is a police agent in some circles is because he has been dishonest about his involvement in the torture of two sisters, for which he served four years, and his current wife, Tia Moyo, served a stint also. I wish to state here, unequivocally, that he and his wife not only tortured these two sisters for over a period of three weeks, but also directed two young brothers in the torture. Prior to this period of torture, he also locked up his first wife, Haiba, in a tiger cage that was housed in the garage of a home he leased in Inglewood, California. Dr. Karinga also hit on wives of some of his closest confidants, and I personally know of one sister who is writing a book in which she asserts that he attempted to rape her. In fact, there are those I've talked to personally that state this behavior started in the Afro-American Association, which predated the US organization of 1965, when then Ron Karinga had an affair with his vice chair's wife. He owes an apology and release to the sister he tortured and to her family, which was threatened if she broke silence about her true torturer." End quote. That last sentence again. He owes an apology and release to the sister he tortured and to her family, which was threatened if she broke her silence about her true torturer. So we know that the two women who Ron Karinga and his wife tortured were Deborah Jones and Gail Davis. Perhaps you've noticed that all of the victim testimony that has been mentioned up to this point has come from Deborah Jones. Well, Gail Davis was the one who had the hot soldering iron placed in her mouth. It was for this reason that I incorrectly presumed that she did not give testimony because she physically was not able to due to the condition of her mouth. But it turns out that Ron Karinga's personal security, Wesley Kabila, has made it clear in his open letter that Gail Davis didn't testify against Ron Karinga and his cult because he threatened her and the safety of her family. And just so you know, the part about Ron Karenga locking his first wife in a tiger cage in his garage, that is in reference to the wife who testified against him during the trial. In this video, she has been called Brenda Lorraine Karenga. I can only guess that Haiba is a name that Ron Karenga gave her when he formed United Slaves, maybe some fake Swahili name. I could go on about how Ron Karenga likely has a god complex, as is evidenced by the name that he gave himself and has people to call him today, Maulana, which he has taught his followers means master teacher. And that is one translation for that word. But in Arabic, Maulana isn't a name at all, 
It is a title that is reserved for God. And I am 99.9% sure that Ron Karenga really gets off on people calling him God. It is strange to me that a man who was such a degenerate and hypocrite could gain so many devout followers. I have to believe that some of them don't know about his dark past. But I have to believe that some of his followers do know. Do they? Will they all think that he is above reproach? Is he held in such high esteem or is he perhaps too old or too inconsequential for any criticism of him to matter? I don't speak Swahili or Arabic, so I don't have the word for it in either of those languages. But based on my research, he is what my father would call, um, how do you say in English? A jive-ass Negro, that's it. But maybe you disagree. Is Karinga a jive-ass Negro or do you think that it is proper and just for Ron Karinga to be rolled out at the end of every year and propped up as some type of great black hero and role model for taking the credit for inventing Kwanzaa? I'm curious. Please leave your comments below. If you believe that he deserves criticism, please share this video so that the stories of his crimes will not be reduced to or dismissed as white supremacist myth. If you are a black woman who chooses to follow the teachings of Ron Karinga, I urge you to think again and face the reality that the freedom dreams of some black men do not include free black women, and Ron Karinga is one of those black men. Well, there you have it. Ron Karenga, the founder of Kwanzaa, and also the author of the mission statement of the Million Man March, which had at its foundation the call for atonement, to my knowledge, hasn't atoned for his role in the murders of two black men, nor to my knowledge has he atoned for his brutal torturing of two black women who followed him. Instead, he said that people who didn't believe in his innocence in those attacks turned their backs on him. Ron Karinga is the manifestation of not adhering to one's own moral compass. Again, this is not a hit piece on Kwanzaa, but speaking for myself as someone who never celebrated Kwanzaa, knowing what I know about its founder, I certainly never will. Now, beyond the holiday itself, if you are someone who chooses to follow Ron Karinga, I warn you not to bother challenging me on his behalf. I don't care about him, and I will only mock you. I challenge you to hold him accountable. You should demand an apology from him for making a fool out of you and destroying your credibility when you defend him. You should demand an apology for his role in the killings of two Black Panthers. You should demand an apology for his torturing of two black women. I'd like to thank my sister, Chandra, for giving me the idea for this story and helping me with a few sources. I used to hate that mom and dad would leave me at home with you and Shannon during the summers because you would make me read the dictionary and you'd give me tough writing assignments. This was no different. Rick James also served time in prison for crimes similar to Ron Karenga's, but he did not give us a wacky do holiday to top it all off. I published a video about that saga that you can see here. I will also leave a link to that video in the description box. My sources for this video are the Los Angeles Times, EliteDaily.com, Asata Shakur Blogspot, Extent of Subversion in the New Left, Testimony of Robert J. Toms, Jet Magazine, History.com, Ann Arbor District Library, Ann Arbor Sun, Daily Wire, Sussex County Watchdog, Knowledge Full Circle on WordPress, KMTYW Social Education Community, Fighting for Us, Maulana Karenga, The Us Organization, and Black Cultural Nationalism, BlackPast.org, Gangster Revolutionary, 
and The Root. If you want text notifications so that you can get a text 15 minutes before I release a video or 15 minutes before I live stream, simply send a text to 786-632-2135 to let me know that you want text and you will get an outgoing text message 15 minutes before I have a new video release. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Ty Said What Ty Said channel. Please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going. And share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot. And subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that applaud button just below your video screen there and send me some donations, donations, donations. Yeah, baby. See you on the next video.